The first real task for any XFS analysis is to normalize the raw XFS data so that it represents a unit edge step for the absorbing atom. Doing this well is important for all further analysis. And while the steps are pretty straightforward, there are places where this can be tricky, especially for new users, and is often a place where people get stuck. In this video, we'll show the normalization processes and go through a few examples that might give you some ideas for how to better use these methods for your data. Hi, I'm Matt Newville, and this is part of the video series for using LARCH for XFS analysis. The goal of the normalization process is to get XFS data, mu of e, that goes from a value of about zero, below the edge, to a value of around one, well above the edge. The normalization will remove most of the differences in how we measure the data, whether in transmission mode or fluorescence mode, for example, and, and what the scale of the values of the raw data signals are. And with these steps, we isolate the absorption coefficient, mu of e, for the edge of interest as well as the absorbing atom, and then can directly compare these normalized data for the same element and edge, no matter how it was collected. And this is important for all Zanes and XFS analysis methods. So let's start by reading in some data. I'll start with some iron oxide data, one of my favorite examples. Um, here we're, and we'll also go over as we do this, reading in several data sets just to get your feet wet for how to do this well. So here we've read in data. This, this data set has a few columns. Um, it's got mono energy and electron volts and transmission uh, mode XFs. So we'll take the minus log of I1 over I0. Again, for, for fluorescence data, it's important to not take the log. And for transmission data, it's vital that you do take the log. So it's important to know how the data was measured when you're importing it. So I'll say OK, and we'll get this, uh, we'll get this plot. Of, it defaults to show normalized XFs data. Uh, again, it goes from about 0 to close to 1. Um, and let's talk about how it got to this, uh, got this value. So we start by, the, by determining E0, the edge position on the spectrum. And that's shown with the red dot here. And that's a value of 7123 EV. That's been selected as the uh, maximum of the first derivative. So let me show you that. Um, here, we can, for plot current group, we can select a number of different ways to represent the data, different ways of looking at the data. And we'll go through effectively all of these in this, in this uh, video. So here is the, the derivative, d mu de. If we zoom in on that, you can see that the value for maximum value for d mu de is around 7120 something. And that's where the red dot is. That's 7123. That's how it's picked the first derivative. If we plot that with the normalized Zanes and zoom in on that, you can see that it's pretty far up the edge, actually. Um, but at this point, we won't worry about how it's selected that in too much detail. It, it's important to be consistent, and picking the maximum of the first derivative is something that you can easily explain to people down the road. Um, so it's, it's a good default when we get to the point of later on of of modeling XFS data, we'll have to worry about that value again. As the calculations we do, we'll also select a value for E0, and we have to make sure that those are um, close to one another. So well, let's get to the point, let's get to the question of how we got the data to go from 0 to 1, uh, how it got normalized. So let's plot mu of E with the pre and post edge lines that that's sh shown here. So now we see the raw data mu of e in blue and a pre-edge line and a post-edge curve here in, in red and green. Over on this form page, it'll show you that the edge step value it wants to use is 1.38. Um, and it's so, and showing you showing you values for how it got the pre-edge and the normalization uh, curves. It also shows you the element that it, that it determined it was iron K edge, which I'll get to in a bit as being important. So that it's good to, it's good to check that that's got the right, uh, it's identified your data set correctly. So the pre-edge range, for the pre-edge range, it fits a line by default uh, to the 
pre-edge portion of the spectrum. So from minus 205 to minus 70 eV relative to E0, it's fit a line and it's going to subtract that line uh, from the data set. So you can, you can adjust the range for that. So if I click on the plot, say here at something around here, uh, I just clicked on the plot and then I come over to this form and there's a little red pin icon that says use last selected point from the plot. So I click on that, it's adjusted that value a little bit and I could, I could uh, alter it again by moving it around. And you can do the same for this point as well. Sometimes the first data point is not ideal to use. It's, there's still some artifacts in the beginning of the measurement. So for many places, the first data point is somewhat suspect. Uh, and that, so, it, so it's fit a line there and it's and in the post edge, it's fit a curve. Here it says it's gonna use a polynomial that will fit from 150 EV above the edge to 960. So it's fit this curve and it's a quadratic polynomial. So you could, the 960 must be the last energy point if I click here and select that point, it'll adjust it a little bit. Yeah, so it's, it's gone all the way above the edge. Just change that to that um, and fit that. So what it's done here, if I zoom in in detail, is it's taken the value of the green curve, the post edge curve, this post edge curve here at E0 and subtracted it from subtracted the value of the pre-edge curve. So that's a little, that's like something like 1.2 something, and that's like minus 1.5 or something. So that gives 1.38 as the edge step. It's the difference between the green curve and the red curve at E0 is how it determines the edge step. And if I unzoom all the way uh, and plot the normalized, that looks like it's pretty okay. Again, the polynomial type here was quadratic, and you could you could adjust that so that it could be linear. That doesn't for data that extends this far out, linear is not appropriate. Cubic might be better actually, um, and for for data that has a much shorter range, you'll want to make sure that uh, you use a shorter, a smaller uh, range of of polynomial type or a smaller degree. In fact, if you select auto, it will pick what it thinks is an appropriate. Uh, uh, order for the polynomial. In addition, you can see from the normalized data that although we said it should go to one, that it actually, most of the curve is below one. So there's a couple of things you can do. One is you can use this flattened uh, option, which will show, which will alter the data by just pushing it up. This is something that I actually don't recommend. Um, it can be useful for comparing data, but it's what it's done to the data to make that flattening is a little bit arbitrary. And I would suggest that you don't use it much except for uh, in preliminary analysis and for visualization only. Uh, I'll go back to the normalized because we also see that it's decayed, but we actually expect it that that, because the raw data does decay. Mu of E should decay with energy. Um, in a way that goes as e to the minus cubed or something. In fact, the pre-edge should not be a, of a line, or it would be easy to think that the pre-edge should not be a line, but should be a more complex polynomial. And so you can use this Victorine order to select how it would, um, how the energy should decay as that's more complex than um, a line. It actually takes e to the minus first power or minus second power. So it's a negative exponent. And you can see that that adds a little bit of curvature, positive curvature to that to the pre-edge line and then makes the then makes the um, the normalization drop even more, but more linearly. So it is will extrapolate to one better. Um, whether whether you use this or not is sort of up to you. It's it's good to be consistent, but it's not um, highly important uh, for working with most data sets. For working with extended excess data, it can be important to get uh, those right if you're worried about the Bob Waller factors at uh, high precision. Uh, but there's, there's one other, so there's one other uh, approach that I'd like to discuss, and that is because for, the, for this entire approach, we took 
a line or a, a slowly varying curve below the edge and a slowly varying curve above the edge and extrapolated those to E0 to get the normalization. For data with such a large energy range, that works pretty well. In fact, that's really why <clears throat> it's common to measure data below the edge extending out so far, is because this method requires it. But there's another approach, and that is to use the tabulated values for mu of e. That is, the known values for how mu should decay. And this is based on the MBAC algorithm of Su Xing Wen and uh, other people in Jim Penrahan's group. There's an MBAC paper. It's quite, quite useful. And this method here for using MBAC is based on that work. And if you actually if you use this, you should cite their work, not, not this. Um, and so if we compare that, uh, oh, let, me, let me go back here. So the, what it's done is taken tabulated mu of e values, which look like that, that go up all the way. I'm going to cancel. I don't want to save the image of that. I want to zoom out. Um, that's sort of the known tabulated way that mu of e decays over a large energy range and we put the data on top of that it looks like that so that's a pretty good measurement of how the data should decay and how you should think about normalization in fact for this data set we can compare the two we can look at the mbac and polynomial normalized data sets and they look pretty similar um, the, the difference in edge step is pretty small and probably something that would be difficult to explain that one is definitely better than the other. But the MBAC data here, so let's change the edge step from 1.36 to 1.3, uh, 1.3, uh, I'll select normalize or auto. So it's either 1.38 from, pol from polynomial approach or 1.36 from the uh, MBAC approach. So it's a 2% effect for this data set. For other data sets, it can be uh, quite good. And you'll notice that there are effectively no or very few adjustable parameters. We did tell it did use these ranges for how to fit, um, but it's pretty straightforward to use and, uh, and actually pretty robust for most data sets. So it's worth considering using. Let's read in some more data just to get a uh, uh, more handle on how this works. I'm going to stick with uh, fluorescent or for with transmission data here, um, just to be consistent. But I'll read it in a few different data sets. I won't read it in this one. I know it, I know that it's different um, for how it was measured. So here I'm going to take. In fact, I'm going to take make sure that these are all the log of i transmission over i zero. Again, when I read in the data, it will assume the previous. Uh, array names and you want to make sure that when you read in new data that they all get read in appropriately. So here's a bunch of metal oxide, a bunch of other metal oxides and I'll just select them all and plot them all together. The normalizations are all decent but maybe not perfect um, and so you may want to play with how those are how those are done. The, in fact you can see a little bit of swooping here so I might just say let's go to this one uh, I'll look pretty good actually from here. I might say 100, but this wants to have a beginning value of more like 149. So maybe I'll just want to make that consistent. Um, and so I'll, with selecting all of these, I will sit, I will select copy. That will copy these parameters to all the selected groups. So if I copy those, then They've all gone to, so the, all the groups have the same parameters. Um, and I can do the same for the, for the polynomial order so that they're all done consistently. Uh, and now if I plot those together, does that help? The metal still looks a little bit weird, but the other three that extend further out look okay. If I go back to this metal, I think it's that I want to take this one, have that ignore all of the XF portions, which are so strong. Now, if I plot those together, it's done. In fact, it's done too much. So I'll move that in between. Oh, and it's also done linear because it's uh, taken a, such a shorter range. And now there's a little, now those are a little better. There's still some differences there, but they're a little better. 
So copying, so copying uh, for a data set of data it can be very useful for getting consistent, trying to get consistent normalizations. Let's read in some other data uh, from different edges just to get an idea of how this might go for other edge data. I'll read in a pile of selenium data here um, and make sure that these are all the minus log of i trans over i zero. That looks good. Read in these sets of data. I'll Let's go look at those again. Using polynomial order, these all look like they're okay. Um, again, they all are about zero, and then they decay a little bit with with energy. So let's let's make those all be m back um, and see how that works. Um, or mu with with the m back method. That's good and. In fact, I'll copy this to the selected groups. I'll, I want to plot mu with m back. That looks interesting, but OK. Uh, and that one looks interesting, but OK. And that one looks, so if I plot all those together, normalized, uh, plot the current groups normalized. Still, this one looks a little bit uh, unusual. This selenium copper data looks a little bit unusual. And we could clean that up. Um, by going further out, I believe. Or you could just adjust this one. It looks like it clearly wants to do a little bit better job, so maybe I'll just uh, plot those together and... Actually, that looks better now. <laughs> and, the the, and, the, and the sodium silicon it looks a little bit uh, different. So you can adjust those. Again, you can adjust those and maybe even... Uh, increase them by hand as you need to. So that that's clearly wrong. <laughs> and uh, that looks good. Copy those. And we want to make sure that these are all using the MBAC al algorithm. Here, so collect all those and select those. And they look OK. Um, again, that, I think that's a good enough start for this. Let's go read in some, just as a, just as a final example, I know that I'm, we're running out of time. Uh, let's read in some tungsten L-edge data, which can often, again, this is transmission, minus log of transmission over I0. That looks good. The L-edges are often somewhat trickier because they'll have a wider, a, a broader edge here. So I want to make sure, that I, this looks fine. Um, I just wanted to make sure that the normalization step was okay. And we try that with M back and it's gonna do um, an okay job as well there. So all of those look look just fine. Um, so I hope that gets you uh, started with normalization uh, and one of the trickiest parts of and the sort of the first place where you can really run into hurdles with working with XF data. If you have any questions or comments or concerns, leave them in the comments below or contact me about how to better do normalization and what else you might want to hear for this video series. So thanks and uh, see you in the next video.